Believe it or not, it's Monday night once again. Time for voiceover body shop. George is in Boulder. Boulder, Colorado. All right. There by the, uh, what are the name of the mountains there? The, uh, we got the flat iron. The flat iron. Right That's here. right. The flat iron. Flat iron one, two, and three. Yes. Well, tonight on our very program, we've got great guy, a knowledgeable person, a man who has done everything in Hollywood, except I win an Oscar yet, I guess. Um, but we're working on it. Paul Pape will be here and we're going to talk about all sorts of things. And on the tech side, You've actually got a mixer face we're going to talk about. Yeah, we're kind of obsessing over the mixer face. I'll talk about my experience with it so far. All right. And yes, and we'll answer your question sent into the uh, sent in earlier and sent into the chat room. And we'll talk about small room acoustics. I had an interesting one this week. All that and anything else we can think of on VoiceOver Body Shop coming up right now. Two men. Twin sons from different mothers with a passion for voiceover recording technology and the desire to make recording easy for voice actors everywhere. Together in one place. George Whittem, the home studio engineer to the stars, a Virginia Tech grad with an unmatched knowledge of all the latest gear and technology in voiceover today. Dan Leonard, the home studio master, a voice actor with over 30 years experience in broadcasting and recording, and a no-holds-barred, myth-busting attitude for teaching you how easy it is. Together, to bring you all the latest technology, today's voiceover superstars, and leading the discussion on how to make the most of your voiceover business. This is VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products. Source Elements, remote connections made even easier. VO2GoGo.com, everything you need to be a successful voiceover artist. J. Michael Collins Demos, award-winning demo production. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your voiceover website won't be a pain in the butt. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live from their super secret multimedia studio in Sherman Oaks, California, here are George Whittem and Dan Leonard. Good evening. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. BS. Oh, a wonderful chorus this evening. We actually got a crowd in here tonight. Why don't we hit the, can you hit the audience cam there, Sue, so we can see all the people that are in here? There they are. There's, there's Anthony. Anthony Gettig is right there. In case you were wondering what he looked like. It's a pretty sight, isn't it? Anyway. So tonight our guest is Paul Pape, and we'll be talking to him in just a little bit. Uh, and you are in Boulder, Colorado, and you were at a, you, you, you taught a class there or what? I did. I did. I taught a class. I did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I was out here for, uh, to be out here with Maxine and enjoying the beautiful weather. It's perfection out here right now, but also combining work. I'm always, I'm always working when I come out here. And, and this time I got to do a front range voiceover meetup which is created, uh, put together by a fellow named Jason Lechak. And um, it, was, it was great. It was a great turnout. There's about 22 people or so which, who drove all around from the Denver area. And, um, and a fan of ours, yours and mine, Dan, Andy Kaufman was there. All right. A supporter of our show. It was really great to meet him and see him in person again. But uh, it was great. And we talked acoustics. So my brain is has the acoustic stuff, you know, at the front of the cortex. Is that right? Is that um, what's leaking out there? Okay. All right. All right. We'll get to that in just a little bit. And, uh, but boy, it's the weather here in Southern California is also gorgeous. And wherever you are, it probably still is too, because it's still summer and we'll, it'll be fall before you know it. We just right. won't know it here in Southern California because it'll seem like summer until it's spring. Anyway, it's now time for. Voice Over Body Shop presents the VOBS Voice Over 
extra news. All the information you need for a successful voiceover career. And now the voiceover extra news for August 20th, 2018. Your VO motivation. Honestly, what's your chief motivation for performing voiceovers? Or for even wanting to? Is it the joy of the art of voice acting? Or the possibility of fame? Or are you in it mostly for the money? Good luck with that last one. Well, in an article now on VoiceOver Extra, VoiceOver Industry Observer Extraordinaire and, of course, voice talent slash coach slash producer J. Michael Collins details how today's voiceover genres fare meeting those motivations. Note, we're not judging those motivations. The article just points out the directions you might want to take to achieve them. J. Michael details the potential for art, fame, and money in each of these genres. Commercial, animation, corporate explainer industrial, narration, e-learning and medical narration, video games, imaging and affiliate work, TV documentary and in-show narration, political commercials, and automotive commercials. You've done all of those, haven't you, Paul? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a lot of territory for, for tonight. So let's dive into what J. Michael sees as the best for each of the motivations. For instance, art. If creativity and performing is your main motivation, most of the genres would work for you. In particular, animation VO is as close as most voice talent will ever come to being an on-camera actor, J. Michael says. And acting is a part of most genres, except maybe for corporate explainer industrial narrations and imaging and affiliate work. In the corporate world, he explains, a good voice and solid reading ability will take you further than the more acting-heavy genres. And imaging and affiliate work, while it's trending toward conversational, is still dominated by the announcer voice, the land of the best pipes. Okay, how about fame? Like, will the public become aware of you as a voice actor? <laughs> well, ditch fame if you're into corporate narrations, e-learning, and medical, political, and automotive VOs. Interestingly, J. Michael notes that imaging and affiliate work often creates local celebrities. Okay. Of course, your video game character voices can attract a fan following. And while most commercial voiceover actors don't become famous for their work, an iconic campaign or your character might come your way that creates an industry buzz about you, even in pop culture. Lastly, what about money? J. Michael sees money in most niches, except video games and imaging affiliate work. He pegs corporate narration as the blue-collar lifeblood of many voiceover careers. Yet high-end commercial work still offers the biggest paydays, especially at the union level. You'll find much more detail about all of these opportunities in the full article at voiceoverextra.com. And you'll learn even more about each genre in the two-hour instant download webinar recordings by J. Michael that are available now at voiceoverextra.com. See the training column on the VoiceOver Extra homepage. It's your daily resource for voiceover success. And uh, my stuff's available there, too, as well. So uh, make the best of it. You can find all sorts of cool stuff there. But, yeah, J. Michael hits it on, on the nose there that if you want to do this for fame, you are in the wrong business. How many A-list voiceover people do does, does anybody know? I mean, see? Just total crickets here in the room. Very few. So, very few indeed. Sure. I actually have a webinar myself coming up on uh, VO Extra. At the end of September, I'm going to be doing one on audiobooks and audiobook recording. Cool. So Outstanding. We'll keep uh, information piped into you guys about that. Yes. Always a, uh, a very interesting subject and, and something a lot of people want to know. Uh, so in tech news this week, you actually got your hands on... A mixer face i did i got myself a mixer face um you know these things are making the rounds now all the folks that did make their indiegogo contributions years ago for uh with the reward of a mixer face should have them by now if you don't let them know um but this is what the mixer face looks like in the flesh i know you've probably heard us talk about this a lot we saw it at nam in the flesh 
Um, and now we're getting to try it out in the real world. Um, I gave it a good rundown during a uh, podcast session I recorded the other day. Two full hours, or really actually more by the time we wrapped. It was probably two and a half hours that I was running through this. And I was using um, a TLM 103 inside a booth. And um, being able to turn on the high pass filter, beautiful thing with a TLM 103. You know how sensitive those mics are to low end. Absolutely. And this one, this helps deal with the low end very, very nicely. Plenty um, of gain in it too? Plenty of gain. Um, you know, of course, I was using the 103, which has a pretty good output already. Um, I was running it at, well, you can see where the gain is right now. That's about where I had it when I was doing the show. So it's kind of typical, right? About two thirds of the way up, maybe. That's about and right. Then, yeah. And then your dedicated monitor level control for your headphones is here. Um, but then you also have the blend control, which uh, you, some of you are maybe familiar with from some other interfaces. But it's nice that if you're doing something with speech coming back to you like a podcast, or if you're using it with Skype or Zoom or doing a phone patch type session, this lets you get more me. I want more me, less of them. This will let you do that in your cans. So that is a really nice feature. And it has two of them. Why two? Because it's got one to blend both microphones. So if you're doing an interview um, and you had two mics hooked up, you can control the blend of both microphones independently in your headphones. And then down here, an aux input. It's called aux three and four. That really is um, a feature that I'm not sure how often people will need it, but if you do need to play back something, again, podcasters could be pretty cool. You could have playback sourced from another computer or a headphone jack on another device and bring that up into the mix. So that's pretty cool. Um, you're gonna see later in the show when we mention this thing again, that it also makes a good on-camera companion. So if you guys are doing any video stuff, I know a lot of people are getting to doing some YouTube. This thing is an awesome companion with a video camera or any camera that doesn't have proper inputs. Um, you can run this right into your iPhone. So you could have your iPhone mounted to the top of the camera, have this device recording the audio. But if your camera does have a microphone input, you got it covered also because it has a line output jack, which is dedicated to sending a stereo mix or a stereo feed to your camera. And it has a high low sensitivity because folks sending a sound into a microphone input on a camera, how many like bad <laughs> cable access or really poor productions have you heard? Like, let's say like uh, some sort of a, a board meeting from, or the, you know, something like that, where the audio is unbelievably overmodulated and distorted. <laughs> Always trying to run a mixer. I'll bet you Sue knows a lot about that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying to run a mixer into a microphone input on a camera never works well. Well, this has the sensitivity control to knock down the output so you don't overdrive. One other little kind of hidden thing, other than the obvious microphone inputs and uh, microphone inputs here, which are combo jacks for microphone and instruments and line ends. There's also kind of hidden on the edges, two balance jacks, bow one, bow two. So those are like your standard left and right line outputs you'd have on like a Scarlet or some other interface that can be used to properly connect and drive sound to a pair of studio monitors. So this will actually work as a standard audio interface for home use as well. There's no reason why you couldn't have it do everything that you need to do in a home or on the road, but I'm sure most of you will probably be focused on using it on the road. So lastly, I've mentioned this before, another thing it sets it apart is that it has an internal battery. And the internal battery allows this unit to run while connected to an iPad. Mac or Apple limits the amount of power that an iPhone or an iPad can provide to a device. So generally, unless it's like an Apogee mic, just about nothing out there can just plug right in and get its, all of its power from the iPad. It just doesn't give the power it needs. So this thing is internally powered, gives you proper 48 volts uh, for your phantom power, and it gives you um, plenty of mic gain, but some, some might find it really important for their needs to have good headphone monitoring, and it does have that. It 
it can drive quality headphones at a, at a decent volume quite, quite nicely. So last thing I'll say about it is, you know, it's not just about the product, it's about the packaging. And I think they kind of nailed it by providing a single page user manual. And I think that makes a heck of a lot of sense. Most people never read the dang manual. They just don't. So they condensed the most important stuff down to it's because we know how it all works. Come on now. Plug it in and it works. This this thing's pretty user friendly, but this manual guides you through some of the finer points um, on a single, like five, four by six card. So that's the mixer face. Um, It sounds great. If you want to hear what I sounded like on it, it, the, the uh, latest two episodes coming out the next couple of weeks from the pro audio suite, all of my voice was recorded on that. So you can give it a listen. Outstanding. Well, yeah, we'll be talking a little bit more about the mixer face a little bit later on. And, how to get uh, one. At, and, and especially how to get one and the best place to get one, of course. And Paul Pape will be with us in just a couple of minutes. So stay tuned for that. We will be right back with a little discussion on small booth acoustics and answering your questions sent to us here at VoiceOver Body Shop. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Bob Bergen. And the evil the the Pokey Pig. And you're evil the the loving the evil the evil the evil the voice over body shot box. You know, there's an amazing event coming up that I want you to know about and to participate in. You know, I had a chance the other night to talk with David H. Lawrence the 17th about it and confessed I had my own issues to deal with. It's about replacing the limiting beliefs we all carry around with enabling beliefs that propel us towards success. You've heard them before, and maybe you believe them. Things like, I'm too old to get booked. I need a better mic if I want to compete with the pros. I hate auditioning because I never book anything. I need to join the union as soon as I can. I'm not good enough to be doing this professionally. I'm just faking it. Sound familiar? Well, VO2GOGO's got a way to destroy those beliefs once and for all. It's a 21-day journey via live video called Believe 2018. Here's the URL. Go join VO, the number two, gogo.com forward slash believe. That's VO2GOGO.com forward slash believe. It's ridiculously cheap and it's ridiculously effective. Once again, vo2gogo.com forward slash believe. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. And we're back here on VoiceOver Body Shop. Paul Pape will be with us in just a couple of minutes, but this is a show about voiceover home studio tech. At least it started off that way. Uh, But we have a question that leads right into the segue where we just plug the crap out of ourselves. Uh, Petrea Bruchard asks, I have sort of a tech question. I'm really enjoying the tech part of my home studio, but there's still so much of it. What's that? That's good to hear. I mean, how often do you hear voice talent saying that? It's yeah, great to hear that. Exactly. But there's still so much I don't know. Can you recommend a way to learn the basics of audio engineering, a college class, YouTube videos, anything? Well, see, now that's a total perfect lead in to what we like to talk about. You know, aside from voiceover tech, we like to talk about who it is you need to talk to about voiceover tech. And that is you. And, and, 
Dan. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Point the wrong way. There you go. I'm looking the right way. I mean, there we go. Anyway, uh, yeah, you can you can check us out. Go on the internet. You know that thing that everybody seems to spend an awful lot of time on, and go to either one of these sites, and you will find the two guys that know more about home voiceover studios than anybody else on the planet, guaranteed. There's a lot of people out there that say, yeah, I can help you with that. You know, yeah, I can do one of those. It's like a doctor, you know, a new doctor saying, appendectomy? Yeah, let me see. Yeah, I could probably do one of those. No, we're the only ones that really understand the unique environment that you guys work in, which is a lot of places, which is one of the things we'll talk about tonight. So if they want to get help from George, all they have to do is go to georgethetech.com. And um, it, I've got a lot of resources on there, some free stuff as well. But one-on-ones with me, you know, there's a lot of learning material out there. Of course, you can, there's books, there's, you know, online videos. But frankly, to be honest, if you want to learn what you need to learn to be a voice actor, spending an hour with me and Dan one-on-one you're going to come away with like exactly what you need to know. And Dan, he's over at. Where am I? <laughs> I know I'm here somewhere. There I am. You can find me at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Really, spending an hour with us, we will take you through the process of what it takes to really make your home voiceover studio sound the way it's supposed to sound like. Whistle. I keep bringing that up, and now George understands what that means. Yeah, it's your audio is supposed to sound a certain way. And George and I were two of the guys that wrote the book, that wrote the actual literal standards for what home voiceover studio is supposed to sound like. So if we say it's good, it is good. So yeah, I, I Petrea, I mean, or Petria, sorry, Petria. If I said that. Yeah, close enough. I, I it sounds I mean, right. I, I went to a university to learn a lot of audio engineering, but this is years of accumulated knowledge or accumulated knowledge. It really, really is. Um, you know, you can go online and certainly find some great, some online courses. There's like a lynda.com, L Y N D A.com. There's certainly courses on there about audio. Um, but it, there's so much to learn because of the so many varied fields in audio, different needs for audio, it can be kind of mind blowing. So um, you probably want to tell us or look and decide what it is specifically you're wanting to learn. If you just want an overview of what's a sine wave, what's Hertz, what's that, if you're just trying to learn that, then you'll find plenty of great books. Uh, Harlan Hogan's got at least one or two on his website. And you'll find some good ones on Amazon that are about the theory of, of audio. I haven't read one in a while, so I don't have a, a title handy that I can give you. But let us if you have an email, if you want to email us, we'll we'll find a couple of good titles and let you know. Absolutely. Now, Fred North, who is a regular viewer of our show, asks, I know you've said this before, but how do I tell the difference between electronic hum and vibration for my AC or furnace? That one, you know, that's actually pretty easy. Send the audio to us. <laughs> because usually we can tell in about a second and a half, that's not electronic noise. Electronic noise tends to be at a very specific frequency level, usually like 60 hertz or somewhere around there. And yeah. if you look at the waveform, it's usually mechanical sound is very, very deliberate. And it's like there's, there are regular intervals in there. So that's the kind of stuff that we see. Plus, you can tell the difference by listening to it. I think the problem that a lot of people have is that they describe it in different terms. For example, it's a hum. It's a buzz. It's, it's a, a hissing sound. Everybody describes it differently. And I know you probably get this every day. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, there's confusing terms. People will call what sounds like to me a hum. They might call it a buzz. Could be a, the other way around. But I mean, generally, a hum is usually a simple sound. It's usually like one or a series of harmonic frequencies um, that stand out. And especially with an air conditioning unit, that's usually an electric motor 
motors run at 60 hertz. That's the frequency of AC electricity, but they often have a harmonic at 120 hertz. That seems to be really stands out in a lot of people's recordings. So if it's, if it's something that has a lot of harmonics, it could be a motor vibrating or something like that. Um, that could be what you're dealing with there. Um, but it's sometimes it's, it's a, a very simple tone, just a single frequency. That can be more electrically related. Um, yeah, there's just hums and buzzes and white noises and all those types of noises. They all have different causes. And you know we love to help you get to the bottom of it. It's not always completely obvious at first blush. And right. so you really, even, I know, Dan, you love um, Audition's uh, spectral view. Spectrogram. Oh, absolutely. It, it, it clearly shows me within, oh, look at that. It's right there. You can tell exactly what it is. And then listen and double check and go, oh, yeah, I was right. But uh, you can tell things from a waveform, but you can also tell things from a spectrogram and things that you normally wouldn't see. So mm -hmm. hopefully that's that's how he'll solve uh, Fred's problem is send us hopefully. the audio. Assuming he's got one. I, I don't know if he's got one right now, but Fred, we'd love to help you. Um, there was another one that was just a real simple doll or digital workstation. Yeah, question. Sandy Nichols uh, is track is traction T seven D A W good for voiceover versus Audacity. Sounds like nuclear reactor versus hamster in a in a cage. I, yeah, for whatever whatever reason, traction hasn't. I uh, hate to say it, gotten much traction in the voiceover. Well, it's business. really for music, I think, and that's really what it was designed for. Yeah, I think that Traction was a software that was developed uh, a while ago and then became a bundled software. So it comes bundled with some equipment you might buy. So that's how you know voice actors may start stumbling on it is they, they find it bundled with something they, they uh, bought. It doesn't mean it's bad for voiceover. The problem is it's just sort of outside the realm of what's common. So right. when you're trying to get help, tech support, learn it, things like that. It's, you're going to be an uphill battle a bit because there's just so few people using that system in voiceover. Right. So, you know, I think. I... Oh, George is gone. Well, he'll be back in a second. Anyway, we also want to talk about small booth acoustics. And when we recover, George, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, so stay tuned for that. In the meantime, we are going to take a break right now, and uh, we'll be right back with Paul Pape. So don't go away. Are you confused about how to set up and maintain a professional quality voiceover studio? No wonder. The information out there is mostly mythology. This is the best microphone to use. You have to have a preamp. You need a soundproof booth. This software is the best. Your audio must be broadcast quality consult with someone who knows the truth someone who's been there in the trenches doing voiceover for over 30 years someone with unparalleled experience with voiceover studios who's worked with hundreds of voice actors and designed hundreds of personal studios he knows how to teach and cares about your success in one of the harshest environments known to voiceover your home Dan Leonard, the home studio master. Separate myth from fact and get a handle on your personal voiceover studio. Contact the home studio master at homevoiceoverstudio.com. Hey, everybody. This is George out here in Boulder. Wanted to tell you about our good friends over at Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect. Fantastic software for connecting your studio with other pro studios all around the world. This software is quickly becoming a standard in the business of voiceover. It really is. There's very few commercial studios that work at a pro level that do jobs for national commercial campaigns, local ads, e-learning, anything. There's very few at this point that don't have Source Connect. So if you have Source Connect, you can work with those studios. That's gonna make you more desirable. So it's really something you want to investigate. Go over to source-elements.com. Go get yourself a 15-day free trial of Source Connect Standard. That's the one you want to get, Source Connect Standard. It connects everybody that has Source Connect Standard or Pro. 
And you want to get a, you get a trial and you don't even have to have an iLock key to do it. So give it a shot. Let them know we sent you. And we'll be right back with Paul and my buddy <laughs> back, in, back in L.A., Dan, right after this. Ooh, I think I heard the voice of a body shop. I did. I did hear the voice of a body shop. Beat old body shop. All right. It's time to introduce our guest. Paul Pape is an accomplished stage and screen actor and has also been performing as a voiceover artist with over 7,000 credits to date. He's been heard in virtually every media, including commercials, narrations, promos, trailers, television series, films, video games, and national political campaigns. He's a voice for various environmental and energy-related campaigns nationwide, among his other corporate commercial credits. He's also a producer with his own production company, New Trails, doing all sorts of exciting stuff. Let's welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop, Paul Pape. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Nice to Thank see you, you again. George. All righty. You know, you were with us at the Don LaFontaine Lab when George and I did a show from there. Yep. Low about six and a half, seven years ago. Yep. Oh. I think I also did one with you from George's studio, studio in Santa Monica. In Santa Monica, That's yeah. Great. But now you're in our brand new facility. Well, it's starting right. to age a little bit. but Fancy schmancy. Yeah, it's like an actual TV studio. Yeah. But anyway, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, you're, you're from Rochester, and, I, and yeah. I see you've got, you know, a Buffalo Bills hat uh, on. Uh, we I, long-suffering Bills fans need to stay together, so I brought this in support. I you know. totally appreciate yeah, that. Because I'm there for you, Dan. I, yeah. I, I, I appreciate it. You know, yeah. if you're from Buffalo, you just learn mm -hmm. that your heart will be ripped out yes. at any second. Yes. Yeah, we, so we both, and I'm not far away, but I live with the same pain. Right. So. And the Bills summer camp, uh, training camp is in Rochester. In Rochester. It's St. John so, Fisher. Yeah, That's right. Exactly. So anyway, uh, yeah. so let's talk a little bit about yourself. Now you're originally from Rochester and you right. went to Brockport. Yeah. SUNY schools are the best, by the way. Uh, but tell us a little bit more how you got into uh, acting and then some of the cool stuff that you've done. Well, uh, at the time that I went there, Brockport was the best school in the state for the arts. Before Purchase was built. Yeah. And then uh, I got a degree in theater there. And in my senior year, I was seen in a play by an adjudicator for the New York State Arts Council who was starting an acting company in New York. I had offers to Michigan State and Penn State for grad school, but I decided to get to it. So I moved to New York City two weeks after graduation. I was part of a group called the Colonnades Theater Lab, which there was 15 of us in the original company. And in that original 15, were, I was lucky to be with Danny DeVito, Rio Perlman, Michael O'Keefe, Jeff Goldblum, Peter Scolari, really wow. great group of people. So obviously it was a great place to do an apprenticeship. And then um, about three or four years after I was there, I was cutting my teeth in the theater. Uh, I was lucky to go uh, audition on camera, and I was lucky to land my break when I got a co-starring role in Saturday Night Fever, which kind of launched everything for me and your, brought me your, to California. Your first yeah. On camera audition. That right. It was my very first Lucky audition. Stiff. So go figure. You know, <laughs> I don't know what I stepped in in a previous life, but it paid off in this life. But, you know, uh, but what, what was that, that brought what me was, out here. Yeah. What was that like doing Saturday? Did, mm. did, did, did the people realize when that film was being made that it would be the mega hit that it was? No. No. I think they thought it was a. Um, you know, in those days, television stars didn't cross over into right. feature film stardom. But so John was one of the first people. So. I looked at it as a good opportunity to get my feet wet. Uh, I don't think anybody had any anticipation that it would be that successful. In fact, I don't think Paramount believed in the movie at all. They were more surprised uh, than anyone that it was as successful as it was. So, yeah. But, you know, luckily it was. It was yeah. a trip and it lasted for a long time. It was a good, nice thing to have under your belt. Yeah, you still, still a cult favorite. Yeah. I'm, well, watch I'm, the disco age. Yeah, I'm very grateful, you know, to... Uh, have been a part of, you know, what now is considered, what, cultural film history or whatever. Absolutely. So you, know. so you come out here to L.A., and yep. what are some of the things you've done since you came out here? Well, I was doing a lot of te uh, television early on and that kind of thing, but then I hit kind of a slow spot, you know, where, which happens it's, in this business. That's this that's business. the big city. Right. And uh, I had the opportunity to do uh, voiceovers, which I'd never done before. I had been... I had studied voice in college and, and through professional teachers, but I had never really tried to use my voice to make money. So I thought, well, that might be an opportunity to make a little money on the side. And for whatever reason, they, uh, they were buying what I was doing. Um, I can't really explain why, other than 
whatever it was, they were they were uh, they were saying, okay, we're, we'll we'll go with that. And one thing led to another. I started out doing um, just ADR in the early days, uh, which I, I might disagree with Jay Michael about one thing when you mentioned earlier, and that is not only animation actors, but I think ADR actors come as close to on camera acting as anything as well. Some it's the, acting as well. Yeah, some of the best actors I know are in ADR. They do voice replacement, voice matching. Uh, they have to do prefer, you know, performance art. So I would disagree with him on that one point, but pretty much everything else, he's, he's spot on. Um, so I started by doing that because it was a way to act in between on-camera gigs. And uh, one thing led to another, and I just sort of kept doing that for a while. And then eventually um, expanded from there into other forms of voiceover and, um, you know, commercials, narrations, whenever they would come along, little by little spotty here and there. And then, um, you know, in the last six years or so, and I mean, I've been at it 30 some years, so you go through a lot of different levels of experience. But in the last six years or so, I was fortunate to um, uh, be cast after a, a long round of auditions and demos I became one of the voices for Barack Obama's re-election campaign. And that launched a whole other uh, cottage industry for me. And uh, I do a lot of senatorial, congressional. I did Hillary Clinton's campaign. I do a lot of um, uh, ha, national political campaigns now. So that's become a whole other thing. So you ride all these different waves. You never really know where the ride is going to take you. But if you have a voice, you use it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. You know? Now, you, we were just talking about, you know, what this business is like as yeah. an actor. And I've, I've had a little bit of experience doing the mm. on-camera auditions and it, it becomes very, very clear, very, very quickly that it's got to be in your gallbladder and your heart. It's got to be the actual fiber of your being to continue to get in your car, go down to the, the you know, the casting lounges day after day right. and try and make it happen. And, you know, and I, you meet people that are, I haven't had anything for two years yet they're still doing it. Right. What is that all about? I mean, maybe I don't have that because I do a lot of other things, but what is it all about that you, what it really means to like have the fire in the belly to do just that? Um, certain amount of masochistic tendencies. Well, is clearly. that possible? No. <laughs> no. But I think that if you love what you do, you know, you'll, you'll put up with a lot because it's what you love to do. And this is a very tough business, especially on people that don't have the talent and don't have the, the wherewithal to know that, you know. So I think that is, um, that's part of it. Uh, Brian Cranston, who, you know, who we all know as an actor, talked about for years he was going to audition. He was always aware of how many people were in the room and his head was on all of that. And, and it wasn't getting him anywhere. It was just frustrating him and it was stressing him out. And he finally decided, you know, I have this opportunity to go in and do what I love. I need to go in and do this for me. And I need to go in because this is what I love to do, whether regardless of whether I get the job or not. And I think that is the same even in voiceovers. You do what you do. You do it the best you can, as only you can do it. And uh, if you can do that, I think it removes a lot of the rest because the competition is daunting. In New York or Los Angeles especially, it's daunting. Yeah. And uh, if you allow yourself to focus too much on that, there's no doubt in my head, it'll get inside your head. It'll either psych you out, it'll burn you out, or um, you'll start having panic attacks or something like that. Yeah. You know, well, that I, I've, I've seen a few of those out there. Yeah, it'll, it'll, it can happen. But it's because these, this, and if you're not making money as an actor, if you're not, if you don't, you're not making a living, the pressure is that much more on you when you go into a situation like this. You think it's not, you think you've rehearsed it, then you go in. So I think the number one thing, just, and I think it applies to voiceover, understand yourself well, do what you love, live and die by who you are. And then voiceovers, whatever your signature voice is, live and die by that. Right. You know? Explain what you mean by your, your signature voice. Well, we all have a voice that's unique to us. We, we, none, I don't speak like you. You don't speak like me. Even though we're from the same part of the yeah, country, we have that northeastern you know, accent. Yeah, yeah, but but we sometimes think, and I do teach a class about this at the Don LaFontaine Voiceover Lab. We sometimes think we have to be somebody else in order to succeed. You know, we need to sound like this in order to make it work in voiceovers. And I think what happens is it ends up sounding more two dimensional. You don't add the little nuances that might put you over the top. So coming to terms with who you are as an individual, what your unique experiences are, how you bring to that, 
And as I mentioned in this class, you know, technique, people can go and take a commercial technique class or a promo technique class, any of that. But if they don't have a clear idea of who they are, they end up trying to mimic everybody else as opposed to applying the technique on top of it. It's like building a house without a foundation. The foundation is you. If that's not there, all the technique in the world, no matter how pretty you try to make it look, yeah. uh, may not sell in your voice. So yeah. I think understanding your voice well and what and in relation to your unique um, voice print or whatever you want to call it, that's what can ultimately stand out for you. The rest, you know, the rest is a crapshoot, just like anybody else. Right. You know? Yeah, and, and it's it's... <clears throat> You have to learn the sound of your own voice, yeah. which is, you know, a lot of people record themselves the first time. Going, oh, that's me. You know, and then but you've got to get used to that. And it's not about having a great voice. It's about having a voice yeah. and knowing what your voice is. Well, even um, Don LaFontaine, who we obviously talk about a lot, you know, Don would say it's not a matter of having a great voice. It's what you do with it. Right. Know? And uh, what you do with it is what you do with it. You, Dan, me, Paul. That's the defining difference. Everything else is an imitation. So unless you add some personal experience in it and connect with the copy, I don't care if it's a hamburger commercial, unless you find some way of connecting with it personally, then it's not going to translate to people on the other end as authentic. Right. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. There's never been a hamburger that I <clears throat> haven't been able to relate yeah. to. So well, it's... You're in good shape yeah. there. <laughs> And there's so many good hamburgers here in yeah, Southern I can California. think of a few I couldn't relate to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if you're just joining us, our guest mm -hmm. is Paul Pape, actor, voice actor, a lot of other things. And you're a producer. And yeah. You started now after after a, you know, a career. In, how many films have you been in? 40 films or 20 well, films? Here and there, yeah. Okay. Off and on, yeah. How, did, how does one drift into being a producer? Maybe it's not a drift. Maybe <clears> it's like... I'm making a left-hand turn, and you can become a producer. I think it's something I always wanted to do. Uh, but until I had the financial means to kind of drift into that, I didn't do it. And we've produced, we've produced several short films, many of them award-winning in that. Uh, we are working towards breaking in. Uh, we are working with a couple of the studios now that have looked at a couple of things. But it's been sort of, um, it was a side project for a while, something that I always wanted to do. I think it was just a natural creative extension of my own creative urges that, mm -hmm. and create your own thing. And uh, there was a period where I felt like, you know, I've accomplished a lot in the field that I'm in or whatever, but there's always more you want to do. I think all artists get restless. Right. Know? What does, so, what does producing involve? We hear that word you know, all the time, producer. And yeah. I guess it means different things to different people, but what specifically is it that, that you find yourself doing that you're really enjoying with it? What I'm enjoying? Yeah. Instead of working for the man, I am the man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. That's a very nice feeling. <laughs> I'm you know. sure it is. You know. So, you know. Yeah. What kind of things does that involve? Uh, well, you know, anytime you produce a film, you, you know, you've got to oversee a lot of the script details, the production details. Just like you and George, you know, there's so much technical stuff to be aware of. It pays to have a good um, over an understanding of the overall film process. I happen to have a good partner, uh, Lincoln Logison, who is a very, very experienced line producer and uh, network producer. So he he's great at all that. I tend to concentrate more on the creative side of it, overseeing the creative aspect. He concentrates on the technical and the production aspect of it. And then um, we're now joined by Liz Bliss, um, who is, um, she's she's been in the business since she was this knee high. She's an actress, and she was uh, nominated for an Emmy in her 20s and happens to be my, my lady now, but she happens to have the experience to be involved in that, so I'm really happy to have her uh, involved because she's, got a, she's grown up in the business, so she has a perspective of all the relationships within the industry and all of that, which is, uh, which is invaluable because she's, you know, she's great now. That's great. Yeah. Uh, once again, we're talking with Paul Payton. <clears throat> If you have a question for Paul Pape, and I'm sure they're like accumulating out there, put it in the chat room and Jack Daniel, our czar of social media, will get it to us and we will ask Paul those questions when we get to that time in the show to ask Paul those questions. <laughs> anyway, one of the other things that you've been involved with, last week we had Bob Bergen on, uh -huh, who's a right. big proponent old of SAG-AFTRA. Very old uh, friend, yeah. You know, and talked about the benefits of mem membership and stuff. 
you've been you've been involved in you know with SAG after obviously as an actor, but you've also been very active in trying to get the union to be much more helpful to us voice actors. Correct. Why has why has there been this this lag in them really understanding the value of voice acting to the entire entertainment industry and what have they missed and what are they now trying to do to make you know, make up for that or really try to attract more voice actors to to get involved? It's a difficult question to answer because it depends on what side you're looking at it from. Right. You know, I was on the board of the SAG After Foundation for eight years. You know, and um, I've been very very involved in through the connections and I wanted to use those connections to try to make a difference. I'm really concerned, like Bob is, because Bob and I are old friends and we've. We've done our best to coordinate on this, to get the message across. We've had meetings. We've done our real best to educate the union as to the dangers that we feel uh, some of the pay-to-play casting sites and all that. Now, I understand people are out there that are big proponents of this. But to those of, of us that grew up working union contracts and understand the value that the union can bring to us uh, in the way of uh, contributions to pension plans, some sense of security, uh, standardization of rates, that kind of thing. Health insurance. Health insurance. Yeah. You know, it's all kind of very critical things. And so while I can totally understand how um, voiceovers in a lot of ways have moved out of the three centers of the U.S., Chicago, New York, and L.A., and that it's being done more, I, I, I am concerned that uh, the influence of some of this is dumbing down um, the business and making it riskier for people to make a good living and be protected in the process. That's my point of view. Some people don't agree. Right. I feel, um, and we have tried to educate the union as to some of these because it is our belief that there has been a real serious erosion of union work that is affecting, that ultimately is affecting not only union actors, but the voiceover Everybody. industry in general. Right. And that it's not going to be a good thing in the end if we keep accepting less and less or bidding against each other or that kind of thing. So we have had meetings and that sort of thing where we've done on the other side i know the union has been educated they're aware of this but um myself and bob and others feel they have been slow to react to addressing the issue uh for whatever reasons I they was might say, why, why what not, is it that's they it's cannot say they haven't priority. been educated to it they have been right. but they've been very slow to react to it and I think their reacting to it is a protection not only for union actors, but for all voiceover actors. And so, you know, the pressure continues. We're all continuing to put pressure on them uh, about this. But sometimes the wheels turn slowly. And I just think technology and all the changes in the voiceover industry over the last 20 years have put, uh, have put um, union actors to some degree at a disadvantage because the technology makes it available anywhere. And I believe some of these companies are kind of exploiting it, taking advantage of it. Uh, I'm not a big fan of some of these companies personally. I'm not trying to judge anybody that does use them. Oh, feel I, free. But <laughs> I do feel, well, because I know there are people out there that feel strongly the opposite. But I, I, as somebody that is a hardcore believer in what the union can do for you and who has personally benefited from what the union can do for me greatly, mm -hmm. um, I... I am, it's like a patriot that loves his country, but he can also see when it's missing the boat. And that's how I feel about the union. But as somebody that really truly believes that, I'm concerned not only for um, the future of the union's voice actors, but for voice actors in general. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm repeating myself. No, 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 you're, you're you making know. total sense. You know. I mean, the industry changed <clears throat> tremendously, as you said, over the last right. 20 years. Technology made it available to everybody. Right. You know, so anybody can do voiceover. Doesn't mean anybody should do voiceover, but it does mean that anybody can do voiceover. Right. And well, but, the, it, go yeah, ahead. but it's also expanded the amount of material that is being recorded out there. I Correct. mean, it's not just commercials. Commercials are a little tiny part of the voiceover industry. Right. You know, you're talking e-learning and uh, corporate narration and, you know, there's there's stuff in Europe that we didn't have access to today. I just did a long thing for a European company today. And it, there's just so much more material out there. Does the, is the union intimidated by that? Or no, I don't think that's it. I but I think that I think they've just been asleep at the wheel, you know, and they're not they're not seeing the erosion for what it is in the long term 
threat that it represents in a way that forces them. You know, they're they've got on camera to worry about. They've got a, a lot of other. They've got their own internal sense of culture. Right. And uh, I, again, I want to make it very clear: no one is a greater supporter of the union than I. But I'm also like Bob. I really believe it. They got to wake up. Right. Because we don't want to see this 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 um, vocation dumbed down to the point where it's worth nothing. Right. What you're talking about now, there's a lot more work out there. But there, what it amounts to is salary compression. You're working three times as hard to make the same money, money that you were. Right. I'm still one of the fortunate ones where I don't need to, or I don't need, or, or I don't work non-union work. Okay. But I'm, I'm really kind of in a minority now, you know, and I'm thinking about the people coming after me. Because I'm I'm well past the curve, you know. I'm on the backside of it at this point. I'll, although I hope to work until I'm 80, like or 90, like Peter Thomas did. You know, right. there's no reason I can't. You know, Peter Thomas was awesome. There's no reason we can't keep going. But without those protections, where's the incentive to keep going? Right. At some point, you know. Absolutely. Uh, I've been, you know, I enjoy the health, the healthcare and all that. But if we if we give up too much, and it's up to the actors too, not just the union. If we give up too much of the respect for our profession, then we are giving up basically all rights to a better future for our profession. And in many ways, it makes makes total sense. Once again, we're talking with Paul Pape. Got a question for him. Throw it in the chat room. We'll Mm -hmm. get it to him in just a couple of minutes. Now, another thing we wanted to talk about is... Your, 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 your good friend, uh, the late Don LaFontaine, mm. who I had the pleasure to meet once. You happen to have been good friends with him, which is... 31 years. My yeah. goodness. Uh, one of the things that you and George... George, is still there somewhere? Oh, yeah. Okay. Beat uh, <laughs> George and, uh, and Joe Cipriano and a bunch of other guys got together after, after Don passed away, and you started the Don LaFontaine... Lab right. over at Sega. Tell us all about that. Well, after Don passed away in 2008, actually, it's coming up on the 10th anniversary of that. Wow. Um, you know, we were looking for a way to honor him, you know, in some way, because he'd given so much to the industry, not as only as an artist, but as a mentor. And um, I had this idea. We had kicked around a few different ideas. And then I had this idea one day about what would continue Don's example. And I thought, well, some facility that would teach uh, beginning voiceover actors the equivalent of uh, that limo ride he used to do, which would basically (laughs) serve as a mentor to them and help them along in a way that they could afford because the equipment's very expensive and all that, and and would be open ground. So I pitched, I knew George from Don because he'd been working with Don, and I knew Joe. So I I talked to both of them about it, and they were immediately on board. And Joe, uh, who was well-known in the promo field, which wasn't one of my areas, and who knew a lot of Don's contemporaries, Joe jumped in really quickly. George said, I got it. We'll handle this from the technical side, which we couldn't have done it without him. And I was going to handle, you know, the personal side and all the other. It seemed it was a perfect combination. So the three of us as co-founders then reached out, and uh, we ended up with a 22-member of advisory board with some of the best in the business who most all of them contributed $5,000 each and the voiceover community raised about a quarter of a million. And the, uh, the foundation matched that with another quarter of a million. And we have the result was the Don LaFontaine voiceover lab, which was a hit right out of the gate. And yeah. it's now served. I don't know how many, um, um, actors at this point, there's been a sister studio opened in New York based almost entirely on the model of this one. And, uh, all of it is just following Don's example. Without Don, I don't think the idea would have ever even occurred to me. Yeah. But he set it such a strong example over the years of our friendship that um, it just took over from there. And so we're going to be having, a uh, on the 28th at the foundation, we're having a founders panel. I believe it's already sold out, but there might be a waiting list. But <clears throat> Which is going to talk about Don and his legacy and what he actually brought. Uh, and how it continues to live on to this day. I'm sure George can speak to this as well. Yeah. George, you got a thought yeah. on that? <clears throat> well, I, I, I know one thing that I've heard countless stories about, um, about folks who got that chance to ride in a limo with Don. That Yes, believe it or not, Don did actually work from a limo for a, a good long while when he was so busy 
he just couldn't realistically get to all of his sessions. And um, if you were if you were fortunate and you got to got to know some of the people Don worked with, you could get a ride along in Don's limo, and he was happy. I mean, Paul, you knew all about this, but he he was happy to take someone along, and just let you shadow him and learn from him. And the folks that got that opportunity say it was just totally irreplaceable. So, you know, that was just one of the ways that Don would give, you know, would give back. He would do that for anybody that, you know, that could, that could get that opportunity. You know, he would, he would do that. So clearly a big giver and not long before he passed away, we were working on some ideas that were going to become educational products, believe it or not. Um, that Don was going to help produce. Um, so this all just totally made sense when, when Paul came up with the idea and approached me and, and Joe about it. So, man, I was clearly honored. And that was a big project. And for me personally, just a big feather in my cap to take on a project of that scale. So uh, just, you know, I'm really, it's just going in there. It, make, it feels like you're going to see a kid you went off to college and now is growing up and you walk in there and you see the studio and you see how it's matured and how it's being used and, and how it's, it, it's just, it's really a proud, it's a very proud moment for me to go walk in that place and see how it's done. Is it 10 years, Paul? It'll be, well, no, 2010. So we're a little over eight. Eight years. Yeah. yeah. And I think you, you, you bring up a good point that it's even today when you walk in there reflects the, who he was, you know? It's a very professional place. Yeah. I mean, you walk in there and go, And it stays above the fray. And I think we've done a really good job of keeping the mission of it. It stays above the fray of, uh, you know, we don't charge union actors, non-union actors are welcome, but they're rarely able to get in because it's so full. But the, the idea is that it, it's called a lab for a reason. It doesn't meet or matter if you have no credits or 5,000 credits. This is a place where you can feel safe and come and experiment and work. And we built it with that idea in mind. George's design was about making it a professional working environment as well as an, a classroom. And we worked very closely on that concept together. And I think that's holding up really well um, all this eight and a half years later. I'm sure you'd agree, right, George? You know. Yeah, the classroom you was, know. when I was first, kind of we we're working on floor plans we would sit and look at sight lines we really wanted them the, the the room to be able to see into the booths and so we worked very hard on sight lines it really was designed number one to be a, a educational facility that can that has the capability of doing production quality work which we definitely achieved that i'd say yeah yeah we've produced quite a few success stories too yeah, that's great. God, we I wish I was around for that. You know, yeah, well, because yeah. being an educator, yeah. it would have been great to watch you guys design a classroom. Yeah. But, but you did a good job. It's just gorgeous. Once again, we're talking with Paul Pape, and we're talking about all sorts of things. If you got a question, once again, throw it in the chat room, and we will get to that question in just a couple of minutes. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after this break. Style. Power. You're watching the home of the NFL. The all-new iPhone. Reserve your Disney World season pass now. Through all the runny noses, three in the morning coughs. An all-new American crime story, tonight on FX. This week only, it's Pasta Fest at Olive Garden. Heart rate, crime, blood pressure, perfect. I grew up with the classics. And now with StubHub, I can get authentic tickets to the best shows. The all-new Chevy Cruze from $16,995. Be inspired, then get the beauty that's uniquely yours at Sephora. This week at Home Depot, it's our Garden Fest sale with up to 30% off all garden tools, sod, and seeds. Hi, it's J. Michael Collins, and these are just a few examples of the first-class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the Demo Production tab to find out more. You know, these days, your smartphone or tablet is not only your digital audio workstation, but also your means of sharing content with the world online. Mixerface R4 takes advantage of this environment by connecting your audio sources with the digital ecosystem, making it the ultimate mobile recording interface. Modern location audio professionals demand rechargeable batteries and field reliability. 
Production crews, musicians, online personalities, and field recording enthusiasts alike share a need for a durable, portable recording tool that delivers pristine audio quality, available on the go, session after session. And Mixerface R4 is a modern, sophisticated piece of recording equipment which allows you to create pro-level content in any location. And you want to know something? You can get one at voiceoveressentials.com. Yeah. I mean, they've been selling the, the Micport Pro, which Centrance has been making for years, and now they've got the Mixerface R4. And George, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but tell us a little bit more about it and show us a, a couple of those features again. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a stereo mic preamp. It's got two inputs, but you can use it as a standard mic, mono mic recording device. It's kind of like if you guys, any of you who are familiar with their other product, one of the products is called the MicPort Pro. It's sort of a MicPort Pro on the proverbial steroids. So the same sound quality you would get or expect out of a MicPort Pro, baked into something with two inputs, high pass filter for filtering out rumble from field recording locations, air conditioners in the hotel, great headphone amplifier, um, just really well thought out. I mean, these guys put in the years to develop this product, literally. Literally, uh, years. Because <laughs> they were developing a product to work natively and work correctly and reliably with an Apple product, that took them a lot longer because yeah. it's very difficult to get products that work with Apple iPhone. And these guys nailed it with this one. Right. So if you want one, all you got to do is go over to voiceoveressentials.com. And the best place to do that is right here at VoiceOver Body Shop. If you're on our homepage, which you should be, go down to the bottom, way down there somewhere. Okay. At the bottom of the page, there's a picture of Harlan Hogan talking into a Porta Booth Pro. And you click on that, it takes you right over to voiceoveressentials.com where you can purchase a Mixerface R4. And I'm sure everybody wants one. And he's got them. So... Go over there right now and buy everything else he has as well, including the books <laughs> and the microphones and the headphones and all that stuff. Go there now or after the show. But don't forget. Thanks, Harlan, for being our sponsor for seven and a half years here on Voice Over Body Shop. We love you. We'll be right back. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Hi, this is Carlos Alas Rocky, the voice of Rocco, and you're watching Voice Over Body Shop. And we're back with Paul Pape. Having a great discussion about this <laughs> nutty business that we're in. Anyway, it's time for our audience questions. And first off, it's time for our weekly Jack Attack, 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 Attack. You know, I just write questions so you'll do that. You know, know that, right? I, absolutely. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Well, but we can hear you. Oh, good. Get my bald spot. A little, little more on the back, please. <laughs> can I still talk, though? Sure. Oh, okay. Um, Paul, thank you so much for this interview. You're getting a lot of love in the, in the uh, chat room, and it's well-deserved. Um, with your big success in politicals, something I don't know a lot about, do you approach it differently than you would say commercial or something else? Um, do you have certain characters or can you tell me a little bit about your process? Not characters. I think the distinguishing difference between um, political and anything else is the weight of the responsibility of the message. Mm. And I know people that will work both sides of the fence and they just consider themselves a hired gun. <clears throat> I'm not one of them. You know, I, I work for the Democratic Party. Um, that's who I am. I'm not in, into a political conversation, but I believe you got to really believe what you're saying. I'm not interested in delivering what I consider to be, I consider to be propaganda. Um, it's what I believe in. So I think this, what they're looking for there is a sense of conviction. You have different types of ads. You have imaging ads. You have attack ads. You have what they call brand, you know, a branding ad. You know, there's different forms of political ads. Some are just done by, a, say, a political action committee to make a candidate on the opposite side not look good without mentioning anybody on your side. Right. But the overriding thing in the read is to stand, is to have conviction about what you're saying. Then you just apply to it, whether it's an attitude or something. Um, it's, it's, there's so much political advertising in this country now that I think people are basically overwhelmed mm. by it all. And uh, there's very big money being spent on it. So the people that cut through aren't just the droning voices. It's the people that actually believe in what they're saying and, uh, and who are actually making a point. 
I did one ad that was very successful for Hillary Clinton. Uh, they were it was just a shot of the White House at night with a flag, and they were worried about uh, what a nuclear uh, what the what the response to a nuclear confrontation would be. Well, you feel the weight of that message as you're speaking it, you know, and that's very important. You're communicating to millions of people. So, um, but it registered, I think, because the metaphor was simple and uh, I could connect with the message because I truly believed what I was saying. So I think in political, perhaps more than anything else, I think you always have to believe in what you're talking about. But in political, the message has a lot more resonance and I think a lot more responsibility attached to it. It's not, yeah. I, I love that answer, and I remember yeah. that ad. Yeah. Uh, quick uh, follow-up, which isn't really a follow-up, just an excuse for me to do another question. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a fun anecdote from the making of the interrogation that you could share? Hmm. No, like, nobody's ever asked me that. We, Don well, maybe, and, maybe you should give a little background. Yeah, yeah. The interrogation is a film that uh, Don LaFontaine and I uh, wrote and co-produced together, and it was all ins inspired, maybe is the wrong word, a very good friend of ours, Paul Gannis, who's also a voiceover actor and a good buddy of ours, uh, his son had contracted uh, aplastic anemia, which is mm -hmm. a form of blood cancer. And his son was in the hospital for 18 months doing chemotherapy. And we would take Paul out to golf or whatever, and Paul uh, would just spill his heart out. He was just at a loss sharing things with us that he couldn't. So what inspired that movie... Paul said to us one day on the golf course, and I'll never forget it, he said, I don't know how much more of this I can take. I'm either going to put my son out of his misery or I'm going to step in front of a bus. And so we thought, boy, the decisions that go through a person's mind at a moment like that, the war that they're at within themselves, um, and uh, we just thought, what is the cost of playing God with your own kid's life? And so Don and I decided to explore that, and that's kind of what... Um, that's what inspired this film. And uh, there was a film festival being done that, <clears throat> that dealt with themes like this. We decided to take it on in terms of faith, universal faith. And uh, it did very, very well. It ended up uh, with 14 nominations and ended up at the Palm Springs Film Festival mm -hmm. and all kinds of places. And uh, it, it went much farther than we ever thought it did, but it came from a very personal statement. Yeah. Is um, it still available? It's still available. Yeah, it's not for sale, really, but it's available. I think you can find it on Vimeo or something. Mm -hmm. We didn't. You, short films don't really sell, but we just wanted... Don and I did a lot of video projects together. A lot of them stupid ones. But, <laughs> but, but that's we, the fun. That was, just our, <laughs> that was just stuff we did, you know, because he was always tinkering and he could afford the toys. His George will tell you, he had more toys than he knew how to run. And then... <clears throat> And But we were always doing something like that. And I think George was in on one we did when his kids had a circus at the school. George and I ran camera for that. And, uh, and, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, I helped with the audio production side yeah, on that. Yep. Um, yep. I was, in the, I was in, the, in the switch room with Don. The, and, and the switcher wasn't and, working, you know? Oh, man, yeah. that was intense. That was intense. And I also was on, I actually got to work on interrogation, too. I did. That's at right. That you time, did the I was, sound. I apologize. I forgot about that. I was that. still doing production mixing at that time. Yep. It was a very interesting time yep. for me. I was making that transition from production to just working with folks like Don. Yep. Oh. George has been a part of, uh, especially towards the end, a lot of our project. George was, uh, when we did a memorial service for Don at the Writers Guild, George came in and oversaw the sound and recorded it for us. And So, yeah, he's been a big part of it, yeah. you know. But that, that was the genesis of that picture, of, the, of what it was. And it was a resonating message, and it came from something very personal that we connected with. Yeah. And uh, the guy whose son it was, he actually starred in the movie. And uh, Cool. Yeah. All right. George, you get the next question from yeah. T-Man. Yeah, it was a very moving film. Um, yeah. T-Man says, hey, man. He says, he didn't say, hey, man. I added that. <laughs> 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 he says, Wow. So much good advice. Uh, you have a mature voice. Um, do you think that is part of your getting more work? In other words, has your voice's maturation of tone, do you feel like it's increased your bookings? For me? This is for me? Oh, George. yeah. Yeah, for you. Sorry, um, yeah. yeah, I guess. <laughs> Life experience. You know, I've been doing it for 30. Yeah, I started out doing, uh, you know, 30-some-year-olds, and now I'm doing older guys. But uh, I do believe that... Uh, the experience that you that you acquire along the way kind of comes out in your voice. So I think some of what you might be picking up there, uh, T 
T-Man, is it? You know? mm. I think some of that is it just comes from having years and years of doing it and just being comfortable with whatever it is I comes out of my mouth and the way I do it. So, you know. Well, so, all right. Confidence. Course, Confidence. Yeah, That's a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. And now a tech question from Greg Hill. George. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, we want to know a little bit more about your gear. He's asking what your go-to <laughs> Mike is, and I might want to know a little bit more about your studio too, because yeah. I know well, you, a little bit. You could answer it, but... that question as well as anybody. You <laughs> yeah, put it but together. He's, but he's asking you. Know. you. <laughs> I have well, a... I mean, I, if I recall, your go-to mic is the, is the four sixteen. Is that still four sixteen right and, and the one hundred three? Depending on the on what we do, you know. So the to me, the the one hundred three has all the bells and whistles of the U eighty seven, um, and in a smaller package, you know, for a voiceover artist, at right? Least, exactly. To, with the padding and all that. But uh, that's my; those are my go-tos. I'm using the 103 a lot more now, uh, especially for the political. It gives a little more warmth to it and overall a little more sensitive. But I like the 416 on the road uh, because if I get into a hotel room or something like that, you know, it's a little more targeted. And so I tend to use that when I'm in a place that's not quite as, uh, as uh, uh, soundproof as my studio or whatever. Right. Uh, my favorite piece of equipment, George will talk, is my uh, the UA Apollo that I have. The Thunderbolt. That's a great piece of equipment, and yeah. that's and be able to do presets, and I can run everything from in the booth with the plugins, and uh, I just I love that. Now I have an, a, a twin that I carry with me on the road in what I call my nuclear suitcase, <laughs> and I do all of you that. You got the football, <laughs> yeah. And I and I just got my mixer face. I was one of the people that crowdfunded with it, and. I haven't uh, cracked the case on it. Well, I cracked the case, but I haven't used it yet. But I'm really glad to know how it worked with the 103. I was very carefully tracking where he put the gain settings and all that. And uh, I'll be mimicking that as I give it through the paces. But that's going to be a nice thing just to carry around if I'm working somewhere else or on the road and I need to do a quick audition and I want it to be broadcast quality. I could carry that with me and use that anywhere. So it's going to be very effective in that way because you never never know where they're going to need you or call you. Right. So. And all um, I got was a T-shirt. Yeah, I was on so. the go- I was on the golf course yesterday and had to stop in the middle of my round to go home and do a pickup for something. Uh, God, if I had had the equipment with me, I could have done it that way, and they could have just mixed it in. You know, I could have done it right there in the car because of the battery powered aspect of it. You yeah. know, uh, yep. Doug Turkell, the announcer, asks, and we sort of talked about this. Oh, no. What's the latest on the fabulous Don Lafontaine voiceover lab? You said you're. You've got the panel coming up. What yeah. other things are offered? We're in the middle of uh, what's called a Founders Series right now. And uh, Founders Series is all the people that helped um, create the lab, the advisory board, are coming together to do a series of panels. Uh, we're doing one on the 28th, which is uh, all the people that personally knew Don, just talking about Don to kick it off. Then we have George, I know, is planning to do on Home Studios. We're going to have a large promo panel, uh, animation panel, people like James Arnold Taylor and Reno Romano and people like that. So we're going to do a series of panels. And on top of that, we're bringing back the poker tournament that we had. Oh, great. But on a smaller venue. Okay. We're going to be doing the first one at Don's house. Uh, and it'll be a little more of an exclusive event because we were finding that when we did the big one, it was a lot of work and a great party. But with all the overhead, it, we weren't bringing in as much for the lab as we could. But now we can do the same thing on a smaller, more exclusive level. And so we're going to be doing it at private homes. And uh, I'd say the big thing coming up is that we're going to be producing a um, spoof of the uh, old radio dramas, radio plays. Excellent. Which Excellent. is what I had in the back of my head when I was asking you if these old mics work, because we might need them. Oh, they you do. Know? So <laughs> if they disappear, blame George, because okay. I mean, he's going to be helping us with that. <laughs> but uh, we're gonna, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing written by Melissa Disney's husband that I've actually done once already. And it's uh, like the behind-the-scenes hijinks of a old time radio, radio drama a yeah. lot of fun a oh, lot of those fun are great it's always yeah. great seeing one of those done on stage yeah I'm done as a radio and that'll play. be a couple of nights at a at a theater for a couple hundred people at a time so that'll be great cool and uh, uh tom machin has a question george there's not much that paul hasn't done in vo from seeing his list but uh so what's actually on his bucket list so paul what is something Boy, you haven't gotten it done yet you want to voiceover do? wise um uh well let's see i think i'd i would like to do i'd like to have a reality show like um mountain men or something like that because <laughs> uh, i watch those shows all the time 
ice road truckers. Yeah. You well, know, um, I'm perfect for those, but I, I haven't pursued them hard enough, but I'd like to have one of those on an ongoing swamp basis. Swamp people. Yeah. <laughs> whatever. You know, because I'm such a, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I just eat, you know, I watch a lot of them, you know. Right. And there are some I go, well, uh, that would be easy. Yeah, I could do that. So yeah. I'd like to take one of those on if I could. Um, promos is something I've been in and out of my whole career. Uh, I haven't pursued it. I've been, you know, Don used to push me hard to go for that, but I was busy doing the other so I probably would like to revisit that area a little more than I have, although I've been able to do a fair amount for Fox Sports and some other people. But uh, that's an area that I feel like uh, there's a little more room for me to um, fill the uh, fill the tank a little bit on that one. You know, so I was proud of uh, Fred North has the last question. He says, The union doesn't seem to make any sense for a voice actor in the flyover states. Why in Louisville, Kentucky, should I join the union, and how would that help me? Fred, to be perfectly honest, I totally understand your reason for asking that question. And uh, I, I don't really know, other than I know that the protections that the union does afford us are critical to having a future in it. But if you're just beginning and you're working and you're, in, you're located somewhere else, um, as much as I'd like to tell you to do it, I don't want you to cut your nose off to spite your face either. But I do think that as, as a profession, we need to come together, regardless of where you are, to protect our profession in terms of how much we're paid. And everything. we do need to hold the line. Yeah. Whether it's a union line or a non-union rate, I think Dave... Cavassier and Wovo are doing a great job in that regard, and you're involved with those guys. And, you know, there has to be some sense of standardization. Otherwise, we're all prone to being taken advantage of. So I, in lieu of not being in the union, just, you know, watch your back. Right. We are businessmen as well as talents. The one thing that's really changed in this business over the years is that we've had to become technicians, not just voiceover artists. If we're going to work out of the home we have to be able to handle it technically. I think that's got to be worth something. It's not just about our voice. Right. If uh, I, you've got I tend the equipment to think that. To, yeah. Got, yeah, you've got the equipment <laughs> to support. You've got everything else to do. But I, I think you would wholeheartedly agree that yeah. that is part of our job now to understand that. So if we're going to take the time to understand it and invest in it, I think that's worth something. Yeah. See, my, you know, my, my thoughts are always like you need to learn it so you don't have to worry about it. You know, it's like right. hit record and go. Make sure that it's right. right. And so you don't have to worry about it. The only thing you really want to worry about is what's on the paper and See, that sort of thing. I'm I'm technically proficient, but I'm not you or George, okay? What I one thing I like about the George comes in, he sets the presets up for me on the UA Apollo. I know which one to go to depending on right. if it's a commercial read or whatever. I'm I'm but I can I you have to know enough to troubleshoot if something goes wrong. So I know enough to be effective and to be able to deliver a product quickly, be professional, get it to them quick. I know how to troubleshoot my own things. But the better you understand it, the better off you are. And uh, you guys are obviously the masters of that. Well, you know, we, we appreciate so there's that. There's a plug for you, but it's the truth. You know? Well, thank you. We greatly yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. We appreciate that, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> Nicely said. Well, Paul, thank you so much for coming back and joining oh, us here thanks, and Dan. coming Appreciate to the, the, the new studio here. And uh, meet you guys. And, uh, all righty. Good luck to everybody. All right. Yeah. Uh, if if they want to get a hold of you, if you're teaching, are you uh, teaching no. privately at all? No, I don't. I no, no, Smart. It, you know, <laughs> I teach at the lab, but I don't charge for that. But okay. uh, I like giving back in that way. But not, no, I'm not teaching as of now. Maybe that'll change someday. Yeah. But no. yeah. You have any other projects in the no. works right now with your production company? Well, we're getting the, we've got two or three that we're trying to, we've got a feature that we're trying to break down into a seven part series now, because that seems to be uh, the way to go with Netflix. And we also have another picture over at the uh, Hallmark Channel. Excellent. So we're uh, waiting for word on those. There seems to be some interest. We'll see what happens. All right. We're trying to tickle those along. All but right. Thanks a lot for having me. All right. It. Paul Pape, yeah. everybody. We'll be right back to say goodbye right after yeah. these messages. 
Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. All right, we're back. And thanks again to Paul Pape for joining us and enlightening us on <laughs> this is a nutty business, but you got to really want it. So uh, next week on our show, uh, joining us here in the studio, you going to be back next week, George? I'll be back. All right. Now oh, it's it's nice, you know, having a guest here, but you know, it's good to have your best buddy there too. Um, next week in the sh in, in our very studio from the Voicecaster in Burbank, uh, Catherine Haran will be with us. She is a casting director and coach, and we're going to talk about casting and coaching and all the stuff that goes on over at over at the Voicecaster, and that'll be really interesting. And uh, also, we have a special, extra special guest next week. Uh, David H. Lawrence, the 17th, will be joining us for a short bit. He has something he wants to talk to us about, so make sure you're here for that. Uh, then we're taking a couple of weeks off. It's Labor Day, and while we've done a show on Labor Day before and had hot dogs and all that stuff that goes with it after the show, we're, we're taking it off this week. And then timing-wise, next the following Monday, it's Rosh Hashanah, so we're just not doing the show. You know, you could be here, but Marcy would go, who are the people out in the garage? <laughs> yeah, so we're not doing it next week. But then on September 17th, we return with Kat Cressida, who will be with us. And she's a very interesting lady. So make sure you're here for those particular uh, shows. Uh, who, pray tell, are our donors of the week? A lot of familiar names. Tracy H. Reynolds floats to the top here because his donation just came in. Uh, Thomas Pinto. That's right. The Thomas Pinto. The Thomas Pinto. Um, yeah. Um, Eric Aragoni, still hanging tough with an episode with donation to the show, which is really amazing. Uh, Andy Kaufman, who I just mentioned, I got to see down, uh, down in Denver. That was really great seeing him in person. Thanks, Andy. Um, Trey Mosley. Thank you, Trey. Philip Sapir. And we got another one from Sarah Borges. And let's see, make sure I didn't miss any here. If I missed one, let me know. You know Michelle you Blanker. <laughs> and oh, Michelle, right. Amelia, let's see, Amelia Barella from Amelia last week. Barella. That one. Or is it Amelia Bedelia? We're not we're not exactly sure. But uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. We really appreciate those little donations to big donations, whatever they are. One at a time, recurring, whatever works for you. It, it, it's all very helpful. Right. Thank you so much. Yep. And the proof is in the pudding, which is why everything sounds good now. Everything looks good now. And we have a show. And it's all because of you, because we do it for you. We really appreciate your support. Uh, once again, if you need help with your home studio, you can go to George. And that is... GeorgeTheTech.com. And, of course, Dan Leonard does it, too, over at homevoiceoverstudio.com. So make sure you check us out there. Uh, also, you do a podcast. I'm starting a new podcast. Everybody podcast. Everybody podcast. <laughs> um, the Pro Audio Suite just recorded a couple episodes. I mentioned that earlier uh, on the Mixer Face. Um, they'll be coming up soon. One of them is a Source Connect episode where we talk about nothing but Source Connect and Source Elements. And... Uh, Tune in. It's the Pro Audio Suite podcast. Find it on your favorite pod kicker, podcatcher, or just say, hey, Google, listen to pod Pro Audio Suite podcast. That's right. And you can listen to this show as a podcast, which many of you do, uh, since everybody's doing a podcast. Heck, we've been doing it seven and a half years. We're way ahead of all you guys, uh, which you can find on Stitcher, Podbean, 
iTunes, anywhere that you can find fine podcasts. Um, let's see here. The show logs. You can check out the show log. When the show gets posted to YouTube, if you go there, Jack, De Go Jack DeGolia and Dan Sutton are taking down every word that is being said in this show and transcribing it eh, somewhat. But at least they're putting the time code on there. And when there's a topic that you want to check out, all you have to do is fast forward right to that. And it'll take you right there. And we appreciate that they do that for us. Awesome. Yes. Uh, we do the show almost every Monday, except, you know, the first two weeks of September. We do it live here from uh, our studio here in Sherman Oaks. If you happen to be in the greater Los Angeles area, like Anthony Gettig is tonight, uh, you can join us here in the studio. Just write to us at theguys at vobs.tv. And we'll give you the secret handshake and let you get into the clubhouse here. Uh, let's see. And we do it 6 o'clock Pacific time. So if you show up at 9 o'clock Pacific time, we're usually out drinking by then. So <laughs> that's not going to happen. Um, by the way, show us your booths. Whose booth was this this week? This was... Um... That was a client I was visiting down in the, in the, in the Nashville area named Jeff Collins. That's his... Uh... His control room. It's a really nice space. Lots I, of space around him. High ceilings. It's got all the bells and whistles. A voiceover palace. All righty. Uh, let's see. Um, all right. Well, if you if you want to be in the studio, or if you want to send us your booth, all you gotta got to do is write to us at the guys at vobs dot tv. It's pretty simple. Uh, okay. We need to thank our sponsors, of course, like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra. Source Elements. Vo to go, go VoiceActorWebsites.com. And J. Michael Collins Demos. All righty. And we need, to, of course, to thank the Dan and Marcy Leonard Foundation for the Betterment of Fine Webcasting. Our producer, Catherine Curden, for getting us great guests like Paul Pape. Jack Daniel on the chat room duty and our YouTube and our technical director, director, floor director, all about in charge person of the studio, Sue Merlino. Sue. Yay. <laughs> Jack DeGolia and Dan Sutton for the show notes. And of course, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Um, that's going to do it for us this week. You know, guys, this is not an easy business, which is why we bring you the best people in the business to tell you about why it's such a tough business, but what you can do to make it better. And we're here to help you with your audio because if it sounds good, it is good. All righty. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or V-O-B-S. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next Monday night. Bye-bye now. <laughs>